used to be a battleground up to probably 20 years ago where you could have a genuine debate between scientists. But then what happens is that one side takes over. And remember in science we have this system of peer review where to get your stuff published, basically your peers have got to agree. To get funding, your peers have to agree. So it's, all, it's actually a system designed for groupthink. Eventually one side will take over and they will exclude the others by defunding, um, not publishing or even getting people fired. So that, that will inevitably happen. Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Orpike, and joining me once again is Mr. Jonathan Astro. John, we've got a very serious topic on the cards today. I yep. feel like sometimes in these intros, we horse around, we make fun. We have to discuss it before our guest, Peter Ridd, comes on. Yep, okay. So we're talking about climate change, and it's one of those topics I feel like it's like, you know, it's like the whole gender thing. You know, if you slip up, if you, if you have a thought and you, you, you say it out loud, you know, that's it. The, the, the invisible hand of society comes along and just cancels Christmas for you forever. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Or if you're out somewhere and you say, I, I, I don't really care about recycling. And then it's the same sort of thing, right? Yeah. Or I, I, I don't own a worm farm. Well, yeah, no, I don't own a worm farm. I don't. But anyway, um, yeah, so please excuse. There are, I no doubt, some very smart people listening to this. Again, I'm just going to have to apologize. Um, I, do, I don't know anything about science, Ricky. Neither do I. But, you know, we're not the experts. Peter is. <laughs> you can't love the tone as well. Yeah, Peter is, you know. Like, come on, <laughs> come on, Peter, get it on. <laughs> Excellent. Let's do it. We always tell you the truth here at the New Flash Podcast, and the truth is that we need your help. We need you to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to the show. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment about a show you liked or perhaps one that you didn't. Word of mouth is also a very powerful tool, so please tell all of your friends. And finally, to our Uber fans, if you love what we do, you can send us a little cash via the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Any donation here is very much appreciated. Now, on with the show. Peter Ridd is an environmentalist and a former professor and head of physics at James Cook University in Townsville. His consultancy work whilst at the university resulted in the development of specialist instrumentation for measuring aspects of water quality with the profits used to fund student scholarships and research projects. Peter has published more than 100 papers in international science journals and supervised many successful PhD students. His most recent book is Reef Heresy, Science, Research and the Great Barrier Reef. Peter, welcome to the New Flesh. G'day, thanks very much. So, Peter, we'd like to cover a few different topics in the discussion today. Uh, we've got questions about the controversy surrounding your former employer, James Cook University, and academic freedom. We'd also like to talk about the Great Barrier Reef and touch on some climate science and the state of uh, science research more broadly. Full disclosure, firstly, you're talking to humanities graduates. So, please be gentle with us today. Uh, but Ricky and I grew up in the 90s, and we can remember uh, being told at school endlessly about the ozone layer, uh, acid rain, and and the greenhouse effect, uh, all words which I don't think I ever hear now. Uh, ever. If someone said them, it would be at a trivia night, I think. So I'm curious to know uh, if we solved any of these uh, problems uh, or were there ever problems to begin with? I know we're going back a little bit, but, but could you enlighten us uh, on this point? Greenhouse effect is really just the morphed into climate change. So that's the same thing. Uh, the ozone hole, they claim that it's been solved by changing the refrigerants in fridges and air conditioners, but actually it was almost certainly never a problem in the first place. It was just that the ozone hole, we now more or less know, fluctuates naturally uh, over periods of years. So that was almost certainly um, one of those environmental beat-ups that didn't really exist. And acid rain is probably in the similar category, though... Um, the cleaning up of uh, sulfur dioxide emissions from power stations and cars certainly would have reduced the acidity of the, 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 the rain. But I again think it was never the problem that it was made up to be. And all these things have now been taken over by the climate change boogie bear that uh, scares us all now. I, I just have memories of, of, of even images of of forests without any foliage you know yeah. talking about acid rain and 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 just you know burning uh, especially in australia because the the ozone hole was was apparently just over i think tasmania perhaps or you know. <laughs> 
Oh, I just I'll remember no. that. <laughs> no, no, there, there was a huge amount of exaggeration about that. And it's interesting that it's died out, off. I actually was looking at that, that very question as to why, not that the, the problem died away, because I don't think there was really much of a problem in the first place, but why the climate change thing has just replaced almost every other environmental issue, real or otherwise. So for another one is we're losing Amazonian rainforest and rainforest in Papua New Guinea. Now, that's a real thing, all right? That's a real loss of forest, but you almost don't hear about it because climate change is the only uh, game in town nowadays that anybody's interested in. Well, my, my son started school this year, so I'm getting an insight into the kinds of climate instruction that's that's happening in primary schools. And and I'm convinced that the Australian education system is hell-bent on, on turning my son into either an Indigenous affairs officer, and I think that's a discussion for another time perhaps, or an urban farmer. It, it's all worm farms, composting, growing vegetables, recycling, public transport. As John said earlier, you know, we're, we're both humanities guys and, and not science grads, but but to me, the level of focus on all of these measures seems out of step with their impact. Am I right here? I think you're dead right. And what they're really trying to turn us into is uh, go back uh, from bef to before the agrarian revolution of the 17 and 1800s, where uh, climate was terrible, productivity was, you know, probably about a tenth of what it is now. Um, essentially, uh, there is an aim to destroy agriculture. I mean, I was just talking to a, a farmer's a guy today. They're going to reduce the nitrogen input to cane farms and other farms in North Queensland by about a third in December this year. Now, what do you think is going to happen if you reduce the fertiliser input to farms? You're going to have a reduction in productivity. And this is uh, happening all over the world. And, of course, the, the indoctrination starts not even in grade one. It actually inst it starts when they're about four years old. So in your opinion, uh, are the, uh, I mean, I know it's broad, slightly outside of our portfolios, but are, you know, are there more, as a scientist, are there more productive scientific things that we could be teaching kids that, that might make a difference? Yes. I mean, we should be looking at how to improve the productivity of, of farms. The population is growing. Uh, you can argue about the good and the bad of that, but it is growing. Um, we want to, to pull people out of poverty, and that means improving productivity. And Western agriculture has shown that you can do that while also reducing the environmental impact. Uh, so there's all sorts of things which we should be doing. Um, developing better energy systems that are, that are, are cleaner, um, you know. So, for example, new developments in nuclear technology are something that we should be doing in our schools. Obviously not your son in grade one. <laughs> it might be a little bit beyond him at the moment, but that's where we should be going for. Whereas what's actually happening is that we are going back on these wonderful technological advances that Western civilization has brought us and being hell-bent to go back to the situation of hundreds of years ago. It's a crazy situation that's occurring. But don't worry, the Indians and the Chinese and the rest of the world are nowhere near as crazy as us. Well, we'll get some silly questions out of the way first, uh, or rather some broad questions. Now, this is the one that, you know, you don't ask at barbecues and feel free to correct the terms or the framing. But do you believe the climate of planet Earth is warming and do you believe that it's man-made? I think it's uh, definitely warming over the last, uh, say, 40 years. And I think it's possible that some fraction of that is caused by humans. Um, but I don't believe it's a dangerous warming. And I don't believe the temperature that we have now is as warm as it was when Egyptians were building pyramids. Almost certainly not as warm as it was in the 10, 11, 1300s or when the Romans were, were doing all the stuff that Romans used to do. Could you give us a, a, a snapshot into the into the evidence that sort of makes up your perspective on this? Well, we know that the Earth is warming the last forty years, mostly from the uh, satellite data, which where they can actually probe the the, the uh, temperature of various layers of the satellite. It's done with one or two uh, instruments, um, but there's a huge amount of evidence suggesting this thing called the Holocene climatic optimum a few thousand years ago when it was much, much hotter. So, for example, and the sea level was higher. For example, I could go down to the sea just off the coast, near the coast here, and I can show you raised oyster beds where, you know, because oysters on rocks tend to form towards the high tide mark, and you can actually see oysters, which you can date to four or 5,000 years ago, which are one metre higher 
than the present uh, oysters are, right? Now, now, there are examples, similar examples of this all over the world where you can look at sea level and you can also uh, have surrogates for what the climate was doing. The Sahara Desert, for instance, was far wetter um, a few thousand years ago. So Lake Chad, which is now a tiny lake, used to be enormous. There are all these massive changes in climate that have happened over the last four or 5,000 years that are absolutely nothing to do with a coal power station or, or petrol in your car. Um, the name Greenland for Greenland is because it was green, right? It sure as hell ain't green anymore. It's it's called very substantially in that time. And the initial Viking uh, settlers of Greenland were basically um, almost wiped out because the planet cooled into the little ice age of a couple of hundred years ago. So there's incontrovertible evidence. There's been massive climate change in the last few thousand years. And also that it, it's no hotter now than it was uh, a, a thousand or two thousand or even five thousand years ago. Well, when I think about our prehistoric ancestors, you know, what they had to deal with ice ages and droughts and floods and stuff, earthquakes, it, it seems implausible that in today's age, with all of the amazing technology at our disposal, that, that you know, we couldn't adapt in some way to climate change. You know, the, the first large scale dikes in Holland were built in the 1200s. So why doesn't anyone talk about our ability to adapt? Well, of course, a lot of, the, a lot of people do talk about it, but nobody uh, wants to report on that. You're quite right, a one or two degree temperature rise, this is very, very easy to deal with. I mean, I, I live in North Queensland. I've lived in North Queensland since um, I was 10. When we came to North Queensland, the climate was maybe, let's, let's exaggerate and say it was one degree hotter, cooler. It wasn't, but let's say it was one degree cooler. Would I rather live in 1970 in a corrugated iron, basically little shed, which is what most of the houses were like in Innisfail in those days, with no ceiling fan, certainly no air conditioning, one degree cooler, or nowadays when I can have a ceiling fan and air conditioned, my car is air conditioned. So if you go to, say, somebody living in Papua New Guinea who's living in a grass hut, is their life better now, uh, one degree hotter? No, it isn't. But if you give them electricity so they can have a ceiling fan, their life is is infinitely improved uh, just by that one little ability to keep cool, have uh, refrigerated uh, all sorts of things. So technology allows us to deal with one or two degrees temperatures just so easily. And that's what we should be looking at. Now, the, the sort of the doom scenarios of five or six degrees are quite, quite frankly, just ridiculous that the sea level is going to drown half the cities. If you look at the rate of sea level rise of just a couple of millimetres a year, to cause any damage, it's going to, going to take a thousand years. And we've seen what the Dutch have been able to do uh, with their sinking uh, country. So the question then is, uh, I suppose I want to get a sense of what the climate science academic scene is like. Is it a battleground? Has it always been a battleground in all your time there? Is, is it as contentious and acrimonious as, say, the gender critical feminist academic scene, for, for example, which is something we've covered covered a lot, which is just a total battleground now? So because we, we just talked, you've, you've outlined all this evidence. So how does that uh, fit into the scene and what's it, what's it actually like? It used to be a battleground up to probably 20 years ago where you could have a genuine debate between scientists. But then what happens is that one side takes over. And remember in science we have this system of peer review where to get your stuff published, you basically your peers have got to agree. To get funding, your peers have to agree. So it's, all, it's actually a system designed for groupthink. Eventually one side will take over and they will exclude the others by defunding, um, not publishing or even getting people fired. So that, that will inevitably happen. So no, it's not a battleground anymore. The, the battle actually occurs mostly from older scientists who've uh, left the system or been forced out of the system, such as myself. Um, that's really the only place where the actual debate occurs, which is a great shame. Well, you mentioned peer review in there. Perhaps you could talk to us about about peer review in in the field and and maybe the replication crisis, which uh, I was fascinated to hear on on something else you did. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so peer the average person thinks because scientists often talk about peer review. You know, it's sort of the gold standard that some piece of work has been peer reviewed, and everybody who who doesn't hasn't been in science think, oh, that's sounds very impressive. Maybe it's when a dozen other scientists 
take that piece of work and they redo the experiments and they really check it and go over it and have a bit of a debate. And a year later, they come and they give it a ticker across and that's peer review. And it's not, right? Peer review is when the piece of work is given to a couple of other scientists and they would usually read it for a couple of hours, maybe a day, but, but actually not. Uh, and then, you know, they can correct a few typos and they can see some glaring errors. They certainly won't do the experiments. They certainly won't do the calculations again. And that's peer review. And what we now know is, as you'd expect from such a cur cursory quality assurance process, which is what it is, it's supposed to be a quality assurance process, that about 50% of the science that you hear every day on the news or in the, the, the journals, about 50% ends up being proven to be wrong. Right? So what other profession is as unreliable that 50% of its product, in this case scientific papers, is wrong. And this is what they call nowadays the replication crisis. So it's now well recognized uh, right across science that we have this monumental problem that a huge percentage of the scientific, the recent scientific literature is complete baloney. And that's a problem because if 50% is wrong and you don't know which 50% is wrong, you really now are at a stage when in many fields you haven't got a clue whether you should believe it or not. Um, and so I often say that scientists, my own profession, are now by far the most untrustworthy profession on earth. And that's a very, very sad state of affairs. It didn't used to be the case, but it certainly is now. Well, what's what's the way way forward, Peter? Is there are there calls to to uh, come up with a different system that that replaces peer review? Are, are, are people looking into this? They certainly are. I mean, there's a guy called John Ionides, who's a Stanford University mathematician, who, who really sort of raised the profile of this problem. Um, and it's actually the, 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 the big organisations, scientific organisations talk about it, but they're not really fair dinkum about what the result of it is. Because, you know, 50% of your, your scientific literature is wrong. How do you know whether that's creeping into government policy? So what I suggest is that a lot of the science that you hear, it actually doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. So, you know, there's a bit of science that might come out saying that a parrotfish will eat the coral, you know, on a moonlit night. Well, who actually cares? It doesn't matter. It's interesting. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. Then there's science that's used by companies, right? They're going to use it to produce a better nuclear reactor or a better airplane or a better crop. And it's up to them to then check that work and decide whether it's right or wrong. And by the way, this is where the where the whistle was blown on the replication crisis, because when companies actually started to do that, often medical companies, they'd find that, you know, sometimes much more than 50% of what they were checking was wrong. So, um, but anyway, that doesn't matter. Provided the company checks it and finds that it's wrong, it's been exposed, it's been super peer reviewed, and that's okay. The real problem comes when that science is being used for government policy because governments are notoriously bad at checking whether what they're, they're looking at is right or wrong. They don't actually care. They're not using their own money. They're using taxpayers' money. So for climate change uh, science or what I've been working on a lot on the Great Barrier Reef science, I've been able to demonstrate again and again that major pieces of science that they're using public policy for the Great Barrier Reef is complete and utter baloney. Um, now, it, I've, I've come along and I've checked that myself. Of course, nobody is interested in listening to that, certainly not the government on the, the left. Um, but in fact, what should have happened is that work should have been checked before it was utilised in government policy. So one of the things that I'm proposing is that um, ministers for environment or ministers for agriculture or whatever should have a pot of money at their disposal, the minister themselves, to do quality assurance checks on science they're using for public policy. Well, it, it seems like nowadays there's so much focus on on research, research grants, you know, the dollars and cents. It seems to me that this replication crisis would, would be costing a lot of money if you try and implement some of the science and it doesn't work. So from an economic point of view, wouldn't it make sense yet to have a system like like you're saying where you actually try and rep replicate something so that it doesn't then become policy and then, you know, and money doesn't get wasted? 
Well, exactly. I mean, just on, I mean, th there's that. I mean, how much money are we wasting on the Great Barrier Reef? Probably in the order of a 500 million a year would be my estimate. On my view on something that doesn't need saving, right, we need to look after it, but, but a lot of what we're doing is a complete waste of time. But a lot of the science that is wrong is actually then perverts the science that follows. So if you, there's an interesting case of some Alzheimer's research, which ended up being wrong, but of course, a lots of money then followed to try to follow it up. So John Ionides and those guys recommend that there's a waste of about $28 billion a year just in research funding, chasing up science that ended up being wrong. So that's not science that's been used in policy. That's just in um, scientific funding that has then been wasted because the initial premise was turned out to be wrong. Now, interestingly, when I propose, you know, I'll give the minister of such and such uh, 10 million bucks to check Great Barrier Reef science, the argument that's often used is, oh, we don't really have that much money available. And yet they're spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars every year uh, on all sorts of things. Why wouldn't you spend just a few million? Because one of the things it would do is that at the moment, the, the peer group um, has total control, group thinks control, has, has taken control. And scientists are immune to any real um, harsh, I, I wouldn't say investigation, but, but certainly checking of their work, like really going into it solidly. If scientists know that they're going to be checked really properly and it's going to be public, you said the reef was dead in 2016 from bleaching, which they did, and now we can prove that, well, you got that totally wrong, that will be made public and that will be embarrassing for you. Now, that doesn't happen at the moment. If there's even a small system to check things, you'll find that people will become more reliable. So, for example, in auditing in finances, if an accountant knows there's going to be a, an auditor to come and check their work, it's not worthwhile doing anything illegal. Um, it's just not worth it. At, at the moment, there's no real auditing in the scientific industry. And if we brought it in, all of a sudden, scientists would become a lot more trustworthy than they are now. And presumably, you put this uh, forward and everyone said, that's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> we, we're, we're willing to come with you. <laughs> well, the, the, the main scientific institutions are, are vehemently opposed to it because they see me, oh, I'm just a climate denier, which I'm not. And I'm a Great Barrier Reef uh, denier. Well, I believe in the reef, of course, but I don't believe it's it's badly damaged. So they see this for exactly what it is, is a knife at their throat on all sorts of ideological in, uh, issues which they've become wedded to because the whole science fraternity now in the environmental sciences is completely ideologically driven. Uh, anybody of different ideology has been driven out, such as myself, and they can see that if we started to put checks on Great Barrier Reef science, the whole thing is going to fall down incredibly quickly because it's, I mean, the idea that the Great Barrier Reef is in serious trouble is frankly absurd, whereas the idea that carbon dioxide might be affecting climate is actually a reasonable hypothesis, and there's useful evidence to suggest that, you know, we should at least be concerned about it. Um, but in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, when you actually look at the data, it's the opposite. It's the, the best protected ecosystem just about on Earth. Um, it's in absolutely wonderful conditions. So they, they don't want anything that's going to uh, challenge that particular story. Well, we'll get into the Great Barrier Reef in, in a second, but I just, I'm just i fascinated by this some of this because you, a lot of what you're saying sounds very reasonable. It's not like you're you're uh, um, adversarial or, or that this is totally out there. I mean, what is driving the sci uh, uh, the scientific community or scientists? Like, why aren't they interested in you know? There's that old old uh, Edison quote. Uh, you know, when he was uh, what is it? Um, someone made fun of him about you know failing so many times, and he said uh, you know something to the effect of you know uh, I never failed once making the light bulb. I just found out you know ninety nine ways to, you know, not to make one or whatever you know. Yeah. So uh, uh, what what what's behind uh, some of this thinking uh, with with these scientists? Well, as I say, I think in the environmental sciences, it's ideology. They don't like where that it will go. Um, you've got remember that people who are at the top of the scientific institutions, such as the Australian Academy of Scientists. These people have got to the top of a system which people like myself are saying is now utterly corrupted. 
yeah, they're not going to like that. They've, you know, they've grasped their way up and many of them are, are genuinely extremely talented scientists. But essentially we're saying, well, we've got to have a completely different way about uh, how we do the science. So you're actually criticising something which is, you know, I've got a picture of the Queen behind me there, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, a, it's something which is almost uncriticizable. these systems of science, and they... They uh, like criticising the monarchy in in England. It, you've got to be people get very upset with that. So that's one of the reasons. But I really think it's that essentially that because the systems we've got um, form groupthink, um, and people don't want to accept that there's massive groupthink that's formed in science. Um, people higher up who've done very well in the system are not going to ever accept that. The only way we're going to ultimately reform this is from the outside. We're going to have to have political intervention to refund science, refund it so that there's proper checking. So we actually spend money to check science. Do you know at the moment of the Australian Research Council, if you apply to uh, for funds to actually check somebody else's work, that work that is inadmissible. You cannot get funding to check other scientists' work, right? It's actually against the funding rules. I've tried. I've, I know this for a fact. Um, now, that's that's a fundamental problem. Science is about, you know, checking, retesting continuously. And at the moment, we fund zero of that. So you can see it's a fundamental um, way of looking at how we conduct science that's the main problem here. Well, b before we get onto the reef, just, just a quick follow-up. How much does money play a part to this? So, you know, if you are a scientist working sort of in the climate science field, if all of a sudden, you know, climate change isn't such a big deal, you've lost your job, right? You've lost your funding or you've lost what, what, what you're doing. So how much is, does that play into it, that they've got to keep sort of the thing rolling along? It, it's certainly a major part, especially if you're in a big institution. If you're at an institution, say, like one of the big marine science institutions along the coast here, you've got 100 people working for you. You've got to keep them, you know, they're relying on you to keep the money coming into the institution. So at the higher level, at the lower level, I think most of the people on the reef who believe it's it's damaged are not doing it just for money. Um but then but that it's certainly not the only problem. There are these fundamental quality assurance system problems that group think forms, peer review is rubbish, we don't fund any checking, um, and then that the way that ideology has just uh completely taken hold in many of these things. So those four things are the main areas that mean that the whole thing is a disaster. Well, I think it's time to talk about the Great Bar Barrier Reef. Now, I think it's no secret that we hear that it's in trouble. Uh, so I thought perhaps we could start by, if you if you wouldn't mind, giving us a bit of an introduction to the reef, its size, its features, and and then we can talk about it, its current state. But I feel like even even within you know some of the stuff that, that you've been talking about with a lot of these different people, I think what gets lost is that this is a really famous uh site and um and i feel like the word great barrier reef now i've heard it so many times it has no meaning for me and you've been there and spent a lot of time there so perhaps you could you could give us a, a an introduction to the whole affair well the great barrier reef is the biggest reef system on earth by a long sea mile it's about as big as germany about as big as victoria three thousand individual reefs it's absolutely enormous uh and it's got a huge amount of coral and it's it it's along the Queensland coast, which is one of the most pristine coastlines on earth. Interestingly, a lot of the reef, well, actually almost the entire reef is quite a long way from the coast. So it's 50 to 100 kilometres from the coast, roughly on average. So it's not close to the coast, and that's important when you look at whether it's affected by farm agriculture. Now, I think it's important to say that, yes, people have been going on about the reef for a long time. You were saying that in your early years you heard about um you know acid rain and all those sorts of things well when i was a, a 10 year old you'll be surprised to know that the great barrier reef was dying even then it only had a decade to live in 1970 it was being eaten by crown of thorns starfish so one of the interesting things that happened was that before 1960 there was essentially no science on the reef nobody was they knew it was out there but nobody was doing any science and then the scientists arrived in the 1960s and they found that crown of thorns starfish were eating lots of the reef, and they do. They can destroy a whole reef in a you know just a few months. And suddenly, because it's such a beautiful thing, people thought, well, this doesn't look good. Maybe it's 
it's going to be completely destroyed. So as soon as the scientists arrive, everybody started to worry about whether the reef was actually uh, going to survive. And, and that's continued on for 60 years. And of course, all the data that we've got now shows that, yes, it goes through these massive swings. A lot of coral will die from cyclones, a cranothorn and starfish, but it keeps on recovering. And what, what does coral need to survive and, and thrive? The most important thing is warm, clean water. It's as simple as that. And the warmer, the better. So the, the fastest growing corals uh, live on the Great Barrier Reef, living the far northern area. Um, and in fact, they grow even faster up in Papua New Guinea and um, the Philippines, Indonesia, which is one or two degrees hotter. So they'll grow, you know, 20, 30 or 40% faster in warmer water, which makes a bit of a mockery of all this concern that a little bit of temperature rise is going to kill all the corals when we know they grow much faster in the northern Great Barrier Reef to the southern Great Barrier Reef. So if by the time you get down to southern Queensland, the corals are growing very slowly. If you get to Sydney, there's corals even off Sydney, but they grow so slowly they can't form reefs because a coral reef is actually a, 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 one, one of the 3,000 reefs of the Great Barrier Reef is a, a few kilometres long and maybe a kilometre across. And it's really a pile of dead coral that's built up maybe 50 to 100 metres high, a flat-topped hill of dead coral that's formed over millions of years of coral growing and dying and growing and dying and building up towards the surface. So down in Sydney, the coral grows far too slowly to, to form reefs. Um, you do need clean water, ideally, but it doesn't need to be that clean. But to have the really, really spectacular uh, coral assemblages that we have on the reef, the water is spectacularly clear, uh, which is one of the defining features of the Great Barrier Reef. Well, as for what's wrong with the the, the reef or the, the the alleged problems, I think it's worth hearing, you know, from people who I'm just dredging up from my formative years of of what I know. So we're told that there that the uh, there's coral bleaching going on, and that my 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 idea notion of it uh, is that you know the water's getting warm or something, and it's cooking the the reef or something like that, and bleaching it and turning it white. And in I in fact, Peter, I have these images in my brain of bleached coral with scary music playing, kind of a mashup of, of documentaries that I've, I've seen over, over my time. It, uh, as a, sub a subsequent question is, is that where you think most people have gotten the, the idea that the reef is dying? But perhaps you could introdu introduce us to the, the problem with the reef. Well, coral bleaching is the, is the latest that, you know, they started to really talk about it in 1998. Before that, it was cranothorn starfish and, and the problems of farm nutrients and stuff. Coral bleaching is when a, a, any particular coral is made up of lots of little polyps and they're just a, you know, a centimetre across or so. And inside that little animal, they, there lives an algae called zooxanthellae and they live together and the, that algae takes energy from the sun and it shares that with the coral animal. It's this beautiful symbiotic relationship they have. Uh, when water gets hot or when it gets cold or when there's too much fresh water or just when the coral just feels a bit sick, it will sometimes expel that algae. And because the algae is what gives it the colour, you know, the beautiful colours, so they're mainly brown corals, um, the coral goes white because that's the natural colour of the coral without the algae in it. So there's no doubt that sometimes when the coral heats up, the water heats up, the coral expels that algae and it goes white. Sometimes it dies from that because it loses its energy source. Usually the coral doesn't die from it. It then, this algae is floating around in the water. It takes back new algae, gets the color back, a bit shaken, but it, it lives. So that's what people are going on about. And there's always some bleaching out on the reef in some areas. Um, in every summer, there'll be a little bit of hot water bleaching. Of course, there have been supposedly four devastating bleaching events in 2016, 17, 2020 and 2022, which supposedly killed up to maybe 93% of the coral. You will have heard that and with all the gloomy music. And yet in 2022, we've never had more coral on the Great Barrier since records began in 1985. So that tells you something about all those stories in the last just few years of all this coral bleaching. It could not have killed a significant amount of coral if now we have record high amounts of coral, because even the fastest growing coral, the 
the stuff that get, is most likely to be affected by bleaching, the plate and staghorn coral, takes ages to regrow. We could not possibly have lost that much from bleaching. So the whole thing is a massive beat up. The record high coral on the Great Barrier Reef this year proves that they have been telling things that are not true. I won't say they've been lying, but they've certainly been saying things which are not true. And is, is coral bleaching a little bit like, like bushfires in Australia where, where you know, the, the trees grow back a lot faster or the, the seeds actually, a lot of the, the, the uh, seed pods in Australia actually need fire to, to, I guess, germinate? I mean, is that a similar thing happening on the reef? Yes. Bleaching crown-of-thorn starfish, which eats massive amounts of coral occasionally, and cyclones, which the waves from cyclones just destroy the coral, just smash it up. So that's like, they're all a bit like um, a bushfire, except that bleaching kills very little coral, but the others certainly do. And yes, I mean, the funny thing is that it's like coral reefs are not allowed to ever lose any coral, that a dead coral is just, you know, you can't have a dead coral. Whereas, well, if you go to a forest, you're going to find lots of dead trees. Sometimes if a fire goes through, they're all dead. And that sometimes happens on a reef, especially after a cyclone. Occasionally, it's true, some patches of reefs are devastated by bleaching, small, relatively small areas. And you can see in the data that they recover extremely quickly and, and strongly. And by the way, that's, this, that's the, um, the real test of whether an ecosystem is, is healthy. If you have an ecosystem like an Australian forest, which is a bushfire type uh, ecosystem, don't get surprised when a lot of trees die from bushfires. What you need to worry about, though, is if those trees don't regrow or they regrow full of weeds, and I can show you some examples of that west of here where fires have gone through some native forest and that all that's come back is weeds. Now you've got a, a devastated uh, and very weak ecosystem. But we're seeing again and again with the Great Barrier Reef that when it gets devastated by whatever, it comes back, no weeds, comes back so strongly um, and that is a sign of a very resilient uh, ecosystem. And how much of this, Peter, is based on emotion or based on the fact, as you sort of touched on it before, the fact that it is so beautiful, uh, it's almost like a daffodil in the hand and being smashed by a mailed fist. Uh, so does that, is, is, that, is, that, is this partly what's driving uh, some of the, the reactions? You're, you're absolutely spot on, actually. Uh, I, I've witnessed again and again, often female marine biologists um, talk in very emotional terms. You know, they'll talk about the coral babies that are dying and, and this type of stuff. And you've got to remember that a lot of these marine biologists, when they, they went into marine biology because they love fish and you don't criticise them for that, you know. So probably from when they were five or six years old, they've always wanted to swim with the corals and the fish and you, you can understand that. The problem then is that if you've then got emotional scientists working in a system with no or very little quality assurance where ideology and groupthink take over, it's almost inevitable that the disaster which we have in some of these institutions is going to happen. So yes, uh, there is no doubt emotion plays a big part because frankly, seeing a coral devastated by whatever is pretty terrible. In the same way as when you see a bushfire go through a forest, you really wonder what's going to happen or occasionally up here we get cyclones go through the rainforest and it's just you look at this and you think my goodness will this recover this time um, but you can't have that emotional view this is science and you've got to be a scientist if you claim to be a scientist yeah well i just think that it just seems very I mean, don't don't we kind of want mr spock out there doing doing this work i mean isn't that isn't you know? Mr. Scott Spock would be is an ideal scientist. Yes, that's what we should all aspire to. I love it. Yes, I'm going to use that in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's it's you know we we are hotheads, Ricky and I, and we just love you know loud movies and and uh, you know dangerous books and stuff. And so you know we are we're terrible scientists. We we I, I, I we are more the Captain Kirk figure. We want to be fighting with our shirts off and getting the green slave women and all that stuff. Whereas I want Mr. Spock handling you know the science and not bringing uh, stuff that's got nothing to do with anything into it. You know. Um, and I know, I know that that's probably a tall order because we're all humans, but um, it just seems very – because obviously I haven't been, had any scientific education, so I'm fascinated at what point you could go through 
uh, an entire science degree and hang out with scientists and then be allowed to sort of exhibit um, what clearly is an emotional bias or, 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 or a cognitive bias that, that has nothing to do with, with science. And no one's pulled you up on it. No one said, hey, should we really be, aren't we meant to be scientists? Well, we don't really care about like whether something's massively beautiful or not. Well, in a lot of science degrees, and certainly in engineering, um, it is exactly like that. It's we we do really aspire to the Mister Spock, um, but the the closer you get to the softer sciences, I mean, I'm I'm a physicist, right? It's the ultimate, you know, mathematics, electronics, optics, um, you know, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein type stuff, and then at the extreme, you've got the environmental sciences and it's a world apart it's it's nowhere near as exact um and that's where the emotions can very very easily creep in i think they have crept in uh, so a lot of science as i say is pretty good a lot of physics is very good but once you then leave your degree and end up in a, another institution where you're now surrounded by similarly emotional environmental scientists all in a group doing group think and peer review together, it's just inevitable that what's happened is has happened. Well, your, your dissenting view on the, the health of the Great Barrier Reef got you fired from James Cook University and resulted in a high profile court case. Now, the, the whole affair has actually been covered well by uh, uh, the IPA's three-part documentary podcast, The Heretic, which we encourage our listeners to check out. But we, we'd like to touch on it in this this podcast, if we could. Uh, do you mind telling us about the conditions leading up to your, your being let go by the university? And then maybe we can get into the subsequent court case, perhaps. Uh, yeah, so essentially, I mean, I'd, as you said, I'd worked uh, a lot on the Great Barry for 30 odd years. Um, we'd, for example, invented the instrumentation for measuring whether farm sediment mud was killing the reef, and it wasn't. Um, and But what was interesting is I was finding that all the work that me and my group, we had a big group, um, was doing was being completely ignored by the, by the main institutions writing the consensus statements on the reef. And this really perplexed me. Um, why were they ignoring it? But I thought, well, all the rest of the stuff saying the reef is damaged must be right. Until I started to look at that, and you could, I was able to to demonstrate again and again that major bits of work on the reef were wrong, and I was encountering more and more opposition. And then I discovered all this work on the replication crisis in about two thousand and thirteen, and I suddenly realised we have a quality assurance problem in the whole scientific fraternity. It's particularly bad on reef and climate, but it's actually right across. And I more or less committed myself to to work on this quality assurance problem. And we wrote a few papers on that. What brought it to the head was that um, there's a famous little island just south of here at, near Bowen called Stone Island. And people have been claiming for, uh, that all the reef, the coral there had been destroyed. And there were these famous pictures showing the reef in 1893. And then today, 1893, wonderful coral today, no coral at all. And I'd always been skeptical about this. So I'd got a few people working for me and I sent them down check out to see if these pictures are right. And of course they come back and they find wonderful coral everywhere. And so I then wrote a, a thing to, well, I was contacted by a journalist and I basically said, you might be interested in this stuff because these pictures were being used all over the internet to show that the whole inshore reef was completely stuffed and clearly it was wrong. And my point was not that it was wrong. That didn't worry me. It was what quality assurance systems were being used and had obviously failed so that we were using this completely spurious information to tell the whole world that all the inshore coral reefs had been killed by farm sediment when clearly this was not the case. So I was pushing this whole quality assurance um, uh, idea and of course that got me into a lot of trouble. They didn't like me doing that and that was the first the first strike that univers the university didn't like me for. Uh, yeah, so you you highlighted this problem with with the two photos, and then so so what happens next? I mean, how do you then get to the point where you're you're you know in in court? Well, I was then I was then censured. So I said I wasn't allowed to to criticise the quality assurance, um, and that upset me. Um, and they they put me on a very short uh, string. Basically, if you do that again, you're in really really deep trouble. 
Um, and I did it again. I basically said I wrote an article in um, the IPA uh, book, Climate Change, the Facts, demonstrating that the reef was fine and there were massive quality assurance problems. And I said that due to systemic quality assurance problems, that lack of those systems, a lot of the science coming out of a couple of the institutions could not be trusted. I wasn't saying it was wrong. I'm just saying that if you don't have quality assurance systems, you can't trust it. It may be right, it may be wrong, but you can't tell. Well, those words can't be trusted were the, bought the, the, the proceedings against me, which ultimately ended up with them silencing me. They said, you're not allowed to talk about this and you're not allowed to talk about the fact that we are now um, instituting disciplinary proceedings against you, which may well end up in you being firing, being fired. So they muzzled me not only about what I was trying to say about the reef and threatened me with being fired, but they also told me I wasn't even allowed to talk about them doing what they're doing. And by the way, that is probably a very, very common thing that is happening right across Australia, possibly even today to various academics on other issues. Now, did, did, did anyone actually do the thing that you're advocating now and check your <laughs> check your claims, check your research, like take take a trip out to this island and look for themselves, like do some tests? Did any of that happen? Um, yes, Jen Jennifer Marahassi from the uh, IPA did it. Um, in fact, there was another group that did it, but not, um, not as part of this sort of disciplinary thing. And they both showed that there's, I mean, there's no, there's absolutely no doubt that there's huge amounts of coral. Anybody who lives in Bowen knows there's lots of coral around Stone Island. You only need to get in a boat and drive around the island to see the coral. So it's not hard to do. So Peter, I'm interested in the nuts and bolts of this process. So, because when we hear, oh, it was disciplinary action, they said this, but yes, how did they communicate with you? Was it a meeting? Who's in charge? Who who was was there a panel of people? Did you ever get to meet the people who 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 were you know sort of taking you to task? Stand sit across them from a desk, have a discussion. Well, you know what, what are we talking about here? How does it actually work? Well, they scare the living shit out of you. That's the way they do it, right? So you get um, hauled up in front of the dean who hands you a brown envelope with a whole with 128 pages of allegations. They'd been reading all my emails, uh, all sorts of things like that, uh, to try to bolster this very, very weak case uh, that they had. Um, completely uninterested in any discussion about how to resolve it. Um, essentially, you're a maggot that needs to be squashed was the way it was done. Um, the, the business of forcing a confidentiality order on you is extremely scary because it means that you can't ask for help. Uh, we ended up having to, we were forced to break that. We had to break that so that, because in the end, we knew we were going to court. We knew that it was going to end up in, you know, almost certainly being fired. So we needed to go to court. To go to court, you need a lot of money. They've got an infinite amount of money. You've got essentially bugger all. If you're going to ask the public for money for your court case, and in the end, we got one and a half million dollars to go to the high court. There was such a 10,000 people donated to it. You can't go to ask people for money unless they know everything that's in the allegations against you. So although the initial allegation was, I said, these institutions are untrustworthy, there was another 20 odd allegations that came after that, after they read my emails, after the disciplinary action had started, where, for example, I'd said to students um, who were concerned about my well-being. You know, universities, they pretend to value speech, speech, free speech, but they crush it, all these sorts of things that they were, were reading. So, but I had to make sure that people who are donating could see exactly what had happened, that there was nothing really sinister, you know, the sorts of things that there could be. Um, so we had to break that confidentiality thing. But the whole thing is a very, very scary thing. Um, and they deliberately design it so. But they've obviously uh, believe from their own side, uh, for whatever reason, that you are wrong and a problem, right? That, that, that they they one hundred percent believe. There's no way I can I can believe that from their side, they're cynically just trying to get rid of you. For I, I mean I don't know what do you, what do you think? I mean I'm just fascinated. I mean again this is speculation, but this is deep stuff here. We're talking about people who went on a expensive, prolonged campaign to silence you, 
to to make sure you never work again to take to take uh your prosperity away your 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 everything away so you know i'm i'm interested in the type of people that would embark on that and again they're not mr spock either so who who are these people they don't a lot of these people don't believe that the primary aim of the university is to seek the truth and try to get as close to the truth as possible to the modern university the most important thing is the reputation of the university and i was criticizing scientists of the university and other institutions that were very closely associated with the university i was saying that they had hopeless quality assurance systems and was demonstrating that this was damaging the reputation of the university and you only have to look at everything they wrote they were saying you are damaging the reputation of the university that goes against the code of conduct whether what i was what, what i was saying was true or not was completely irrelevant to them it was never raised it never came into it um, they completely misunderstood the the right of academic freedom of speech where academics are, are, are supposed to be able to talk especially in their area of expertise and this was certainly in my area of expertise that was irrelevant it was the reputation of the university and thou shalt not criticize anybody in the university uh, in that regard well you you ended up winning this case and and i wonder have there been any any repercussions for james cook university and and perhaps all universities in general because of your case you know are universities on on notice so to speak well we well technically we did not win it actually uh, technically they the high court upheld the um so we won at the lower lower level but when by the time we got to the higher level the, it was upheld that the university had a right to fire me because the main reason was that i broke their confidentiality directive so because i talked about their illegal what, what what the high court agreed was illegal activity so the high court we won in the sense that the high court agreed that they were should never have censured me in the first place that everything i said was within my right of academic freedom i had a right to say that this work was untrustworthy for whatever reason but perversely they said the university still has a right to fire you because you broke their directive to talk about their illegal activity which is a bit crazy but Apparently that's the law. A lot of illegal commentators have actually made a lot of comment on that particular part of the decision. But we certainly won on the right of academic freedom of speech, and that now is written into the statutes, essentially. And it's also been um, the government of the time, largely at the behest of Pauline Hanson and a few of the Liberal guys, have, we've now got strengthening of the academic freedom of speech rules, which I'm pretty sure are being used at this instant in other cases around Australia. So that's a good thing. Mm. It sounds like they sort of Al Caponed you, you know, they got you on tax evasion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> none, of the, none of the good stuff. No, no, that's right. I mean, essentially, they were wrong. Um, they never should have, they never should have censored me the first time. And they certainly shouldn't have censured me the second time. And strictly speaking, if they'd never done that, there never would have been the confidentiality um, order, which I wouldn't then have had to have broken. And by the way, one of the strange things about this decision, which a lot of the legal people have said, in, my, in the academic freedom of speech clause in my enterprise agreement, it specifically says that I'm allowed to uh, criticise decisions and um, activities of the university, but somehow or other it didn't apply to them telling me to shut up about their illegal activity. <laughs> so it's all a bit strange, but I'm out of it now. And it's probably not a bad thing because, you know, universities now are, are pretty uh, disgraceful places in many, many regards, not just this. There's so many things about the modern university, which is um, so sad to see. I just wonder where would you where would you be now, and what would you be doing if James Cook University never took any disciplinary action against you? Would you still be teaching there? Yeah, I guess I'd still be speak, teaching if I wasn't um, fired for not giving my pronouns or objecting to the indigenous prayer being said at the beginning of every meeting and and various other things. Uh, I guess I might still be there, um, and I'd certainly be teaching, and I'd be working a bit like I am now um essentially focusing on this quality assurance problem uh, that we have in science in general 
So I believe you've partnered with the IPA, the uh, Institute, Institute of Public Affairs, on an initiative called the Project for Real Science. Did you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I don't work uh, in any paid way for anybody. I, um, the IPA uh, invited me to come and I said, well, I'd be very delighted to work for the IPA, which I think is a fabulous organisation. Um, but because I'm often accused of being in the pay of the sugar industry or the oil industry or the coal industry, I said, no, I'm not going to take payment from anybody. In fact, I don't know whether you saw a recent video by Friendly Geordies, um, you know, Jordan Shanks. He accused me of being in the, the pay of all sorts of people. It was lovely to be oh, able really? to say. If, yeah, you, if you should... you've gotten mentioned by, by Friendly Geordies, then th that's high praise because, he, you know, he's a rabble rouser. And if you're worth talking about, well, that's, that's good, Peter. Well, actually, I rather like Friendly Geordies, but he's a bit he's a bit over extreme on the left wing side for me. Um, but I like some of the stuff he does, but he got a lot wrong. And one of the things was that he said, well, I must be in the pay and I'm not. But the Project for Real Science is really, from my point of view, is about quality assurance of science. Those are the words I just keep on banging away because that is the fundamental root of the climate change problem that we... You, we essentially are in a situation that it's difficult to know what we can trust in the way of this so-called science that we're hearing. Now, it doesn't mean to say that there's no problem with climate change, but we have this massive problem that it's impossible to know what to trust. It's just impossible. And we've got to do something about that. And I think it's relatively easy and extremely cheap to do, but there's hu these huge entrenched interests um, that don't want to admit that the replication crisis is a thing that the group think has taken over and that so many of our science institutions are untrustworthy. So that's what I'm working on in the Project for Real Science and also the Reef Rebels. So we've got this channel called Reef Rebels where we documented a whole lot of the completely dodgy science on, on the Great Barrier Reef. And is that is that a YouTube channel? Yeah, that's the Reef Rebels YouTube channel. We've got that on. So we, we, put, we put a video up there every couple of weeks um, and we're going to, although at the moment it's mostly about the Great Barrier Reef, we're going to start to broaden it into other areas of science where it's actually failed us. And COVID is a beautiful example of that. A lot of the so-called science, which we were supposedly fed by the big institutions, turned out to be complete rubbish, like the fact that the, the vaccinations did not stop uh, transmission of the, the, the disease. Now, that's... I can understand a mistake was made initially. They thought that was going to be the case. But as soon as it was obvious, it wasn't the case. And that was very shortly after the vaccinations were, were given. They should have said, well, sorry, guys, we thought this, but that wasn't the case. But they, they dug in and they damaged the reputation of science. And I could give you a dozen other areas, major areas of science, maybe not quite so spectacular, where the scientific institutions have failed us. Well, Peter, we've been talking about YouTube, uh, you on YouTube, and I got to say, you know, when people click on the link, they're going to be uh, given some friendly contextual information uh, down the bottom. It's going to say uh, that the United Nations says climate change refers to a long term shifts in temperature, temperatures and weather patterns, mainly caused by human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels. That'll be on all of your videos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's so sad that you, the United Nations, UNESCO, the Australian Academy of Science, the Royal Society, you know, the oldest scientific institution on earth and probably the second oldest institution on earth, I, you just don't trust anything they say anymore. It's just a shocking situation that we've come to. And, I, you know, if I could go back 30 years and hear me saying this, I would just be bewildered about what has happened. Well, maybe to zoom out a little bit here, I, I was recently watching Russell Brand on on Bill Maher, and and he was talking about corporations who profit from crises. He cited the war in Ukraine, COVID, which you mentioned, and climate change as as evidence of what he calls a perpetual crisis that corporations seize on to build profits. Now, looking at this big picture of of climate change, do you think that the the, the discussion is being corrupted by corporations with with vested interests? Totally. And the funny thing is that friendly Geordies and the like think it's the oil industry paying people like me. I'm, I'm still waiting for the telephone call to, you know, hello, this is the Shell Oil. We, we want to give you a million dollars to tell lies about the Great Barrier Reef. And it just never happens, right? <laughs> but And yet there are huge industries that are getting massive amounts of money from all these crises. You know, the 
the wind farm industries, the, the people who are fudging the electricity market in Australia, um, you know, you name it in COVID, Amazon, Harvey Norman probably made a lot of money. You know, all these, pe all these big uh, organisations that can make a lot of money from this. So the funny thing is that the left think that it's big oil corrupting the, the, the sceptics like myself, but actually it's different organisations that have a massive interest in perpetuating a lot of these things, which are very likely um, to be not true. But as I say, because the science is so corrupted, it's difficult to know one way or the other in many of these things. Well, during lockdown, you know, you, you couldn't go to a cafe or a restaurant, but you could go to McDonald's. So, you know, that tells you something. <laughs> yes, you know, the McDonald's that's right. We're, we're still open, you know. We speak to, you know, a lot of people who have said things you're not supposed to and been penalised for it. Do, do you have any advice to someone who's listening who who's on the fence about whether to speak out? Well, what I would say is that if you're over 55 and you're approaching retirement, you've got a reasonable amount of money in the bank, you actually have a duty to speak out, get yourself fired, do it properly. Because people of your age can't, right? Because you've got a, a kid at school, you've got to, you know, you've got to keep body and soul together. Um, so I really think I, I often wanted to start this mob called kamikaze academics, which would be, you know, old geezers in academia to go out and say, I don't <laughs> believe that a man can become a female or a woman or whatever it is, you know, and get themselves fired for saying something really radical like that because nobody else can do it. The young people, keep your mind open. You've probably got to, you know, be a good boy for the moment. But when the time comes, make sure when the uprising comes, you've got to be there with us, right? And it's us old geese that have the duty to actually uh, blow the whistle, ring the bell. Well, Peter, I want to give you the final word. You, this is where you can you can mention anything we haven't we haven't uh, spoken about, but also perhaps you can maybe address. You know, some people might be having a bit of an epistemic crisis listening to this. They're thinking, "Oh, what if I, you know, where am I meant to get good science? What is good science? Am I following good science? Where do I go for all of that?" So maybe maybe you could build that in. It's an extremely good question, and it's very difficult to know. Um, you have to look to see whether it's been well checked, whether there's been a whether it's likely that groupthink has taken hold. Essentially, it's virtually impossible in many areas. There's many areas of science where I suspect there's a problem, like do statins that a lot of people take reduce uh, cholesterol? Do they reduce um, uh, improve life expectancy? I've looked at that again and again and again, and I can't make up my mind whether to believe the tradition, the uh, sort of the institutions or, or to believe the equivalent of Peter Reed, right? Because it's just too hard to do. And this is the, the fundamental problem. We have to fix the quality assurance systems in science. Otherwise, nobody can really have any faith in a whole lot of things. And that's a terrible situation we're in. Well, Peter, we, we have a final question that we ask all of our guests, and we'd like to know what you're reading right now. Oh, I'm reading the... Uh, the Humber One Ton Truck Maintenance Manual. It's a 1956 <laughs> uh, British military vehicle that's probably one of the worst vehicles that was ever made. I need to describe this. This is a them. paper folder. It looks about 100 years old. It's got, it's hanging, it's got papers stuffed in it. Yeah. It, it's uh, by the Electrical and Mechanical Engineering Regulations by command of the Army. And I have to say, it's by the command of the D Defence Council and it contains classified UK information. In 1956. So a bit of light reading there. <laughs> That's uh, great. I tell you what, we've, we've asked almost, well, probably over 100 people this same question and we've never had the same answer. No, well, they probably did the uh, the later model ones with your other people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So do you, do you own this vehicle? Is that the why oh, yes. you're reading on it, it? It's my pride and joy. It's my pride and joy. It's a beautiful, it's a four-tonne, a uh, Rolls-Royce engined uh, military truck. Uh, it's just beautiful. <laughs> well, but it sounds very quiet where you are in beautiful Townsville. Do you tear up and down in this thing or what? Uh, well, it's got a Rolls-Royce engine, so it makes almost no noise. Oh, uh, Yeah, no, I, I drive it. We've got a, a block in the bush and we drive it on the bush roads. Uh, it's basically a four-wheel drive truck. So we do several hundred kilometres was the last uh, last trip. Um, out in the scrub. It's very slow and it uses a lot of fuel, so you don't want to drive it too far. 
Oh, it sounds great, Peter. I, I got to say, watching one of your vi- vi- one of the videos online where you're being interviewed on your deck with all the beautiful greenery, I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I not living in Queensland? You know, yeah, it's great. It's a very good question. Because yeah. mm. <laughs> Sydney, the, you, you know, you, you're paying too much for not very much. You know, just get out of there. Just get out of there. Go to northern New South Wales. Go to Tenterfield, or just cross the border and do it properly. You've convinced me. All right. Thank, thanks so much, Peter, for, for uh, joining us and struggling through our, our, our uh, non-scientific uh, inquiry <laughs> into, your, into your work. Uh, where can people find you online? We've already gone through some of, some of uh, where people can get some of your stuff, but, but perhaps run us through. Oh, best the Reef Rebels uh, YouTube channel is where most of the stuff comes up. That would be the best way. And also, uh, everyone should check out The Heretic, which is the uh, IPA three-part documentary podcast. And uh, also, if you want to learn more about uh, the Project for Real Science, you can check that out at realscience.org.au. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the New Flesh podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.